You're listening to Numerically Speaking, the Anaconda podcast. On this podcast, we'll dive into a variety of topics around data, quantitative computing, and business and entrepreneurship. We'll speak to creators of cutting edge open source tools and look at their impact on research in every domain. We're excited to bring you insights about data, science, and the people that make it all happen. Whether you want to learn about AI or grow your data science career, or just better understand the numbers and the computers that shape our world, Numerically Speaking is the podcast for you. Make sure to subscribe. For more resources, please visit anaconda.com. I'm your host, Peter Wayne. This episode is brought to you by Snowpark for Python, an Anaconda embedded repository and package manager for secure and seamless access to open source in Snowflake's data cloud. This integration puts the power of Anaconda in the hands of Snowflake users, who already benefit from Snowflake's elasticity and performance. Users can now run secure, Python-based workflows directly in the database without needing to copy or move data. You'll have access to the most popular open source Python packages without needing to manually install anything because Anaconda is built right in. We've worked hard with Snowflake engineers to make sure that the Python libraries you're familiar with run well inside Snowflake's fast distributed processing engine. To make sure that this Python capability is production ready right out of the box, Anaconda curated the packages and provides seamless dependency management, while Snowflake provides a highly secure sandbox. For more information, visit anaconda.com slash partners slash Snowflake. Hello, all right, um, and uh, big welcome to Torsten Grobs. Um, he's joining us today. We're really, really happy to, uh, really excited to have a great conversation with him. Um, Torsten is the director of product management at Snowflake, um, who, among other things, covers the data science, machine learning, and AI kind of practice area. So, Torsten, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us on the Anaconda podcast. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, and I'm uh, super excited to, to be here uh, today. Um, so, looking forward to, to the conversation. And me, me too. You too. So before we get started, I have a bunch of questions and things that I think we could talk about. It'd be really fun. But why don't you first give our listeners um, kind of a brief rundown of like, you know, what what your background is and kind of what you do in your day to day and and kind of like what interests you, right, about yeah. uh, kind of these areas that you're you're covering in your in your product management role. Yeah. So in in, in my role today, I probably spent um, the majority of my time every day on things related to machine learning and, uh, and data science and advanced analytics and uh, how do we want to support uh, those in a better way in the Snowflake product. Um, so I've been spending the last year or two years probably now uh, working a lot on Snowpark supporting languages like Scala, mm -hmm. Java, and most recently Python. Uh, mm -hmm. natively on, on Snowflake. So that has been a big topic for us um, uh, for, for uh, some time. And obviously now we are very interested to, to, uh, to expand on those capabilities and make the product even better for data science and machine learning practitioners. Um, mm -hmm. and, and prior to that, I've also worked on other areas that are uh, always related to data. So uh, I've worked on data engineering, I've worked on um, on data lake use cases uh, for, mm -hmm. for Snowflake and related product capabilities. And I've been actually a data person since, um, the, since the start of my career, even, even back in grad school, I've been doing data warehousing uh, on uh, clusters. So um, right. quite, quite similar to, uh, in terms of the underlying basic principles of the architecture to what Snowflake can do uh, today, right. or what, what the, the big data processing looks like. These days, yeah, and and it's an it, you know it's um it's an interesting thing. My my background you know is none of that, right? My background was physics, and then I ended up doing a bunch of Python stuff, and then somehow through numerical and scientific computing and Python, ended up having to learn a lot very quickly on the fly, so to speak, about data, distributed data systems, data warehouses, you know, all the Kimball stuff, and like all of these kind of things. Which it's like, oh wow, this is a whole not just an area of like practice and a very lucrative one from a commercial standpoint, but also it's a very well studied one, right? It's one with a lot of academic theory behind all these different kinds of things. And yet when Python started getting pulled into more and more data lake use cases, let's say, with, with the, the, the big data transformation and some of the disruptions that were happening 10 years ago, what I noticed was that a lot of, guys, a lot of theory got pushed to the side, right? So 
you know, on the one hand, you would have database nerds arguing about different kinds of schemas and stuff. On the other hand, you had a lot of data practitioners just pulling things out of the database into CSVs and cranking through them with Python or R. And so the, the, for me, just watching this happen, again, with no, you know, I had no particular religion about any of this stuff. I was getting pulled in as a consultant to do Python stuff in various places. And it was just interesting to me to see where some of the sort of, let's say, classic or maybe legacy architectures were clearly over, they were, they were they'd overshot what the customer needs were. And yet there wasn't new things yet that were meeting customers where they were at. And you see some of the early NoSQL stuff. And then with cloud databases, obviously with Snowflake, of course, rising uh, into the fore in that category. Um, with all that stuff happening, to me, it's been really exciting and interesting to see the last just 10 or 15 years of evolution in this space, how much has happened in a space that was you know, somewhat stable for a few decades, I think. But somehow all of it changed. What do you think caused some of that change in your mind? Actually, do you even agree with me about that timeline? If you do, you know, what what do you think caused I, the change? I, I, I think uh, I, I think I agree with with the timeline. And I think the 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 change really was about the the ecosystem that data practitioners could lean on to get their jobs done suddenly mm -hmm. got turned upside down. Right? And I think actually. Ah, yeah. Uh, uh, Python uh, played a, a, a pretty big role in that and, and amplified some some of those changes. So if you if you think about let's say the, the traditional way that uh, database systems over many many years tried to embrace uh, advanced analytics, data science, or what we call machine learning today, it it had a very kind of typical approach that you would just essentially select a set of libraries that you as a database vendor felt comfortable about. You would drop them into your product and expose them to a SQL surface, right? And right. Um, I, I would argue that approach has seen very limited success and very limited adoption. It right. resonated with a particular audience that was comfortable writing SQL queries. But right. all the other folks that don't necessarily see SQL as their preferred language, they really didn't have a lot of incentive to, to go and try that out and use these kinds of products. And right. that then essentially created uh, created a space that then got filled by, by various mm -hmm. alternative big data offerings that we all know, right? And that were catering to different programming languages, Java, Scala, and eventually Python mm -hmm. um, as well, and these these programming languages then also and their support created a whole ecosystem um, uh, of of open source communities that could right. provide a very very rich set of tools that yes. made the data engineers, the data scientists, the data developers so much more productive in their preferred languages, and uh, that 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 really just bootstrapped this 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 whole space. And um, and I think it, 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 when when I reflect on that, um, it, it it's super important now that we and speaking of myself here uh, to to a degree as a more traditional database person that we realize the value that this ecosystem brings and we embrace the preferences of the people that don't necessarily have grown up speaking SQL. Yeah, and it's like it's not um. It's it's not so much that people rejected SQL. It's just that actually so many more people cared about data than just the people who could afford to buy an expensive SQL uh, database, right? I think that's really the the, the it's, it's almost like when the Bible got translated into English, so the so the regular people could read it, right? And they didn't have to learn Latin. All of a sudden, you you just got a lot more people kind of into the whole thing. So I think that's absolutely right. And then. You know, part of my thesis around this also is that um, just the explosion of, um, you know, the the web kind of went through the dot-com boom and bust cycle. There's a bit of a winter for a while, but then with, um, during that winter, a lot of residences got wired up with, uh, with, with, you know, broadband and web technologies were improving a little bit and, you know, HTML5 was coming around and browsers were getting faster. And then you had both social media really passing the inflection point, and then you had mobile coming in. All of these things create a viability around web and mobile and digital, 
like the e-commerce promise of 99 got manifested, you know, seven or eight years later. But then you compound all of that with all these other new kinds of, uh, the, the you know, the big companies now, right? Netflix, uh, Facebook, and Twitter, and all everything. All of that just creates such a large volume of data that didn't start off being built into a well-architected classical data warehouse. It was just all these apps are now dumping all this data. What the heck do you do? So for me, I, I see that like when I was running the meetups and stuff, it felt like for a, bar- for a period of time of like two or three years, every other meetup was someone talking about some yet new NoSQL database or some column store or some other kind of thing. And, and yet no one ever gave the talk of like, why do I hate SQL? It wasn't that people hated SQL. And people, in fact, there was a lot of Postgres and MySQL kind of, you know, presentations too, but but yet there was all this, this hunger to find new kinds of ways of storing the data more easily with less like upfront crap, to, <laughs> pardon my French, but then also opening it up to access from other languages, right? We wanted to use the same language to write the application, do the analysis, and then drive changes in the application. And so you're absolutely right about that ecosystem. And we'll get back to that ecosystem question in just a minute. but. But before we get to that, one thing I want to ask about relative to the languages, you said you in Snowpark, you guys have been doing enablement for many different languages inside the SQL, inside the Snowflake database, besides SQL, obviously. What are some of the weird quirks? Like, obviously, I know Python has its quirks, but Java and Scala, what was, what was the one or two really hard things about getting really good support for those languages uh, in Snowpark? I think... Probably, I'd say coincidentally, um, Java and Scala are the easier languages to support. And that's probably the reason why we started with them. Because uh-huh. the, 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 the way that we've architected Snowpark is that we, we lean on a general purpose infrastructure layer that provides us with sandboxing infrastructure to host pretty much any language runtime that, that, that we want. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that that sandbox establishes a, a couple of really critical security uh, aspects for us. So, for instance, it locks down external access from custom code that runs inside the sandbox, and that's an important property for some of our customers to make sure that mm-hmm. they don't have mm-hmm. unwa- unwanted data egress or data exfiltration from yep. the, the code that that that, that runs. Um, uh, and uh, so that, that that essentially was kind of the, the the key challenge for us is to first pay down that infrastructure investment into this sandbox infrastructure, which we now have, and um, uh, it gives us an opportunity to to expand to other languages at some point if customers ask us uh, to do that. But I think the top priority for us right now is just um, get our Python. Uh, public preview shaped up for mm-hmm. uh, uh, for GA, which is what the team is currently uh, working on. Yeah, yeah. So, so Python was the harder one compared to Scala and Java. Um, yet, it was worth doing. <laughs> I would hope you would agree. Um, and so, so let's talk about in your mind the the so whatness. Like, so now you can do Python in your database. So what, right? Um, what what is what made it worth it in your perspective, yeah. right? To to have that yeah. ability, and, and and maybe just to 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 jump back to to that question, why was why was Python the less obvious uh, one to to do? So I think the, the the first part there is with both Java and Scala, you can lean on the virtual machine as the underlying common runtime. It's it's very mm-hmm. well defined properties. And that then also reflects back on what your sandbox needs to to support. Um, right. And with, with with Python, I think it it the it, it turned out to be a little bit more mixed, right? Because many of the Python packages actually have pieces of native code that run inside mm-hmm. the libraries, right? And uh, that is that, that does not map to the to the mm-hmm. Java virtual machine at all. So this we have to support all of these various native code packages in 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 a, in a good way. On, on the sandbox uh, infrastructure, but we also right. wanted to have reassurances around like what packages can customers actually mm-hmm. bring to the platform, which led to the conversation that you remember when you started talking. Yes, uh, right. Can we, can we actually, uh, can we provide customer benefits by 
leaning on a well-established, uh, well-curated set of Python libraries that comes from the community, but goes through additional uh, vetting, right? Um, before right. It, it gets deployed, right? And, th and that then led to the deep integration of the uh, Anaconda uh, channel um, into, into Snowflake, uh, Snowpark Python uh, offering, right? And um, you know, going through through that journey and figuring that out, that, that those were really some crucial um, kind of points during during uh, our Python journey. Yeah, yeah, and and I appreciate your your pointing that out. I mean, we see this with uh, many of our um, in, sort of uh, embedded partners and customers, right? They have a use case where they are an ISV, they're they're a software uh, vendor with a, a well packaged product. They want Python capability in it, and a lot of the reason you want Python in it is actually not for Python. It's for all of the libraries in Python, right? And then you immediately break into this like horrific hellscape of packaging problems and compiler issues and all these other kinds of things. And so when we've had these conversations, you know, for instance, I think about um, uh, Ezri with ArcGIS, which is kind of a shrink wrap piece of software you install to do geospatial analysis. They want a Python capability, but they want to offer, they want to have some semblance of like a baseline Right, that they know will just work with their examples, tutorials, and they can put their system documentation around. And so for a lot of folks, it's they want to have access to the power of the ecosystem. They know that there's some, there's always escape hatches and back, not backdoors, but there's ways for people to install other things in if they want to um, in, in some of these integrations. But in general, you really want that core set of things where you know how it was built, where it came from, you know, kind of like, who you can talk to <laughs> to get support on some of these things. Um, and that's definitely one of the areas that we have um, seen a rapid growth in, in terms of partner and customer conversations for us. Yeah. Now, in the case of Snowpark, right, because it's running in a production environment, you know, it runs on people's sensitive data. The amount of escape hatches you really want to have available for people is, is more limited in that case. You want them to have the power of some flexibility, but you, they cannot just go and install all sorts of random stuff off the internet, right? There's a balance that has to be struck in terms exactly. of power and capability. Yeah, and and I think that's that's kind of this this how do you strike this this balance between like complete flexibility where you can install what whatever you want, and then you are suddenly realizing that you are subject to supply chain attacks from the the packages that you that you have picked up, which is kind of the, the, the one extreme end of the spectrum, right? And then coming back right. to the beginning of the conversation, right? The other extreme is that the database vendor picks a particular set of libraries for you and locks that down in their database product, right? If you think about that, I think we've we've we've, we've tried to strike a reasonably well balanced compromise now with what we are offering with no part for Python together with the power of Anaconda, because right. now that can actually bring the innovation from the Python community in a very well defined way into into a snow park right and and right. i think that's 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 really the best of both worlds right so you're you're uh, you're relying on a uh, well protected uh, uh runtime environment in which you still benefit from all the innovation that the community brings to uh the python ecosystem right right and i think something that um that uh, practitioners especially those who are maybe earlier in their career who work kind of in a um uh, sort of a sole, you know, uh, in, a, in a sort of a smaller scale. They don't, not part of some big business with a lot of these requirements and compliance and all these things. Um, sometimes people don't quite appreciate this, but a lot of data scientists, a lot of our users, um, you know, ML engineers and whatnot, they're in these business environments where if you want your work to see the light of day in, you know, touching production data on production infrastructure, there are other stakeholders who are going to get involved at some point in that process. And they're going to come down and they're going to, absolutely be asking what are the software artifacts you're deploying into this infrastructure. And if you wait until that point to start having the conversation about what's allowed or what's not allowed or whatever, you will have wasted a lot of time because more often than not, you will have brought in things or you'll be using things that are not acceptable, right? And it sometimes it's obvious yeah. things like this package is simply like, you know, whatever. It's some random package that only exists because some random like PhD student, you know, released it. But there's other less obvious things like this particular version of a library of like, you know, common one, pandas or sci-fi or something. Um, the version you installed links against some library which had a vulnerability that hasn't been patched. 
and IT simply will not allow it to go into production. And now you have to go and go back and recode some of your stuff, which then means rerunning your tests, which, you know, all sorts of things happen. So to accelerate this process for these data science practitioners in businesses, it's far better if they start with something that resembles the production environment as close as possible, or at least have a way to know when they are, you know, bringing things that are outside. And so I think one of the things that's sort of subtle, but but is a, is a deeply important thing is that when you use something like Snowpark, when you have, you know, Anaconda integration in these kinds of places, you are doing your EDA, you're doing your exploration, you're doing your build in the same infrastructure that is also what the deployment infrastructure will be. So that question, that hurdle, which is sometimes insurmountable for people, it just becomes a non-issue, right? And I think that's a really, um, it's a, it's kind of a weird and arcane thing a little bit to try to educate people about, but it's such, the fact that this uh, accelerates people's workflows is a really important point. Yeah, that's, that, that's a really critical point. And um, uh, our hope there is also that we make it much, much easier for data scientists and machine learning pra uh, practitioners to successfully deploy their models from the experimentation phase into the production workloads in, uh, in, in, in their organizations. One mm -hmm. other aspect that might be interesting in this context uh, that I find fascinating is also the cross language uh, interactions and composability across languages. So oh, nice. one, example, nice. one example, for instance, is I, as a data scientist, I start out with my raw data and using Snowpark, I code away using Snowpark data frame APIs in Python because I'm really familiar with the data frame concept. And eventually, right. I, I build a model that I actually will now want to deploy so that it runs in a mission critical data pipeline in my organization. So mm -hmm. typically in larger organizations, that is a point where I would interact with other folks and other functions, for instance, my data engineering team. And they may say, okay, we write our data pipelines, we write them in SQL, and now you're giving me this, this model that you wrote in Python. Now, what's great about the cross-language interactions, it's very easy then to publish that piece of Python code that you have under a SQL surface so that it is super straightforward for the data engineering team to consume that model and invoke it from a SQL-based uh, data pipeline. And that hopefully makes interactions between different functions that may in, in your organization that may have different preferences around their programming languages so much easier. And that could just be one of the hurdle, additional hurdles in, it is. in the process of <clears throat> machine learning model deployed, right? Yeah, it's you know it's one of the things that shocked me when I first learned about it, and it may be news to some of the to the listeners of the podcast. But when you go and you do like the surveys, like we do the state of data science survey, right, of users and and kind of just get people's feedback on uh, on what they see in their daily workflows. For me, with the first few years we were doing it, I was shocked to see how many people said that the impediment to getting their work deployed in production was that they were being required to code their models recode their models from Python into Java or into C++ sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yeah, I see you nodding your head because you know this as, you know, a PM for an enterprise software company that, that makes a lot of sense to you because you see it all the time, I'm sure, in customer yeah. sort of yeah. environments. But for a lot of the, I said like the hip data science crowd that worked at like startups where you didn't have a bunch of people telling you to do this, it just seems shocking that you couldn't just take this beautiful thing that you wrote in Python or whatever and just run this notebook. In production, um, and the idea that they would be forced to code it in Java was was uh, yeah it, it you know people I wouldn't say people fainted but it was certainly when we first figured that out we're like wait what oh you know and I think this idea that you know you can have now an environment not only are you moving code to data but now you're actually moving these you're you're unifying the workflows you're integrating workflows right across multiple different groups and across multiple different kinds of stakeholders without this kind of friction without this kind of war that usually yeah. breaks out political kind of chaos inside organizations that that happens when you have these kind of you know impetus mismatches so i think that's a really i i, I would like to imagine that they, that really makes everyone happy it makes the data management people happy because all your data is now in one place it's not moving out into shadow data, CSVs, and various random shared file systems. But also yeah. for the data scientists, they've got the tools they want to use, and it's on the, all the data there. And then, of course, for the for the operations people, they can use their tools to get access to the same data and then be part of this pipeline. Um, so that's that's all great. And and I'm curious. You mentioned something there that is very interesting. You mentioned about the Snowflake 
data frame, right? And an API there that's compatible with the Pandas data frame. Tell me more about that. How compatible is it? Like where, where, where is the progression of development on that? Yeah. So I, I think the data frame, the data frame concept has been around for, for quite some time. Right. And um, we kind of took liberal, I'd say, inspirations from both Pandas, but also from, from, from the Spark APIs. Mm -hmm. and uh, tried to put together the best of both worlds uh, here into kind of our own twist on a Snowpark data frame API. The, mm -hmm. the interesting piece here is, as I said, it's, it's, it's inspired by, by others like Pandas and, and, and Spark, but what's really unique for, uh, to it is it, 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 it is a really thin client in such that it leans on the underlying distributed compute engine for, for Snowflake. So if you if you write a, a Snowpark data frame program that has a straightforward mapping to the relational algebra, all that uh, the, the, the Snowpark APIs will do is translate that code into essentially a sequence of the relational uh, operators. Oh, that's a query, interesting. A query plan that then runs in a distributed way across the Snowflake compute cluster assembled all the results and shipped them back as a result into the data frame. Now that's the simple use case where you have a trivial mapping between the relation algebra and the operations sure, that sure. you've expressed in your, in your data frame program. The, 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 the more interesting use case is the one where you actually compose um, uh, a custom Python code that you have written, for instance, in a user, user defined function, and you right. want to then invoke that uh, in one of your data frame operations, let's say in an expression in a filter. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, now in, in, in this case, what, what would happen is we would actually take that piece of Python code, um, compile it, and then push it down to uh, the, the server side so that it can run in the Python runtime on the server side and right. inject calls from the distributed query plan that runs essentially as the driver for the whole processing and that's also responsible for populating the data into the cluster nodes. And it would call from that driver program into your custom code that runs in the, in the Python runtime. And now all of that heavy lifting happens transparently behind the scenes. That's the responsibility of the Snowpark APIs to make sure all right. of this is orchestrated and runs correctly so that you can really focus on just typing away in your Python code. Yeah, yeah, and and to to be very clear, right? The 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 Snowpark Python support is is um, there's several different levels of it in the sense of there are full table, there's table level um, functions you could do, but then there is uh, per row UDFs that you could define, yeah. which is yeah. the really really amazing and powerful part of this. And I'm I'm really excited to see what people are going to do with it because to be honest, like this is something that we wanted to see. Kind of, and we have some some of these kinds of capabilities in the open source world. You kind of put together, you put together distributed computing infrastructure around Python. You know, you can have different kinds of storage things. You can use things like Numba to push down the computation to specialize it and run very fast, depending on what your storage looks like and all these kinds of things. But that, and also we've had tools that try to map some data frame ish expression things into uh, SQL, right, into something like a SQL query plan. A lot of these things have happened in the Python open source world, but to have a um, just a leading vendor like Snowflake with so much production data say, yes, we support Python, not only just support Python in kind of a weird way, no, we're going to support it in a first class way where you write using APIs that are, that are familiar to you, you know, uh, Mr. Ms., you know, Python data scientist, and also we will support this kind of like, you know, push down computation with custom Python code, that's really moving code to data in a, in a foundationally, um, you know, just, uh, I think it's a transformative kind of thing that we'll see people being able to do. Um, I know we, you know, we've had the, the, it's not GA yet, but it is in early preview. We have customers that are using it. What are some of the interesting use cases that you've seen people do uh, using the Python API? Um, I mean, the use cases are across the board. I think there's, uh, um, a lot of data engineering that's 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 happening. Uh, people just shaping their data in interesting ways, and um, probably the the most exciting ones that we are starting to see are the ones where customers are tapping into what we, from a from a, from a database perspective, would call unstructured data. Although that's uh, generally not true. This is uh, things like text documents, images, mm -hmm. uh, videos, audio files, right? right. And uh, and uh, 
what's really phenomenal is is to see that there's already such a rich support for these data formats from the Python community. They can literally for whatever file format I'm dealing with, I'm probably finding several options in terms of uh, library oh, yeah. packages that I can pick right. to, to, to actually throw at that uh, file format, crack it open for me and, uh, and and drive value out of that, right? And right. this is really an interesting use case for us that, um, that customers are increasingly putting unstructured data into Snowflake for storage, but obviously they want to create business value, drive insight from that, that, that data. And they are then driving data pipelines where at, at some critical part in that data pipeline, you're feeding that file into one of those packages to crack it open and to then pick out uh, the valuable pieces for that and push them further down. And again, that's connecting different folks with kind of different expectations around uh, their IT landscape in, in a very interesting way, right? So mm -hmm. at the end of such a data pipeline, you might actually have someone that's looking at the structured output of the data pipeline that started with uh, unstructured data and it's pulling up those structures for structured results in a BI tool, for example, right? And it's then, right, right. Uh, then doing BI over that. And all of that is being enabled um, through kind of the connecting all of these pieces with Python in the middle. Yeah, I, and I think there's um, th there's a couple of things I want to build on what you said there. You know, first of all, the idea of structure versus unstructured data, right? Um, it's it's kind of this thing where I don't want to get too philosophical about this, but all data has structure. There's just question. The question is, have you? Is it worth your? You know, is it is it worth the pain in the butt process of structuring it yet for the particular analysis you're trying to do, right? And as I hear you describe this, I'm reminded of um, this uh, this great this great paper uh, from Jim Gray and others from Microsoft Research, um, and and uh, it was about scientific computing. Uh, the future of scientific computing is written in the mid 2000s. And in it, he explored this question of why don't scientists use databases, right? Why don't scientists use databases? Because if you, for, again, for the, for the listeners who are working from a business environment, who come from a you know, business analytics and data science background, if you talk to any scientists, you'll know that in any given area of science, there, there are just dozens of weird storage formats of scientific data, right? You know, in astronomy, it'll be FITS, in other places, it'll be TIFF files. In other places, it'll be a weird HDF5 if you do part of physics. Genomics has its weird files. Other things, like every single area has its own little weird thing. But across the board, what you'll find is that scientists almost never use relational databases. And so Jim Gray, you know, kind of posed this question, looked at it. And, you know, part of it was the time, right? It's just like uh, a relational database couldn't give you anything like that the file system wasn't already giving you, the file system plus a readme at TXT wasn't already giving you. Um, and then at the end of the day, people were building their own file systems and structures. I mean, some of these file formats like HDF5 are themselves really file systems, right? So it's not that people didn't want structure, but what they would never compromise is the ability to quickly access the data in columnar matrix numerical form to efficiently get the, the values they want to compute on. So it was sort of like, not that the scientists hated databases, but just that databases didn't add enough value for the amount of BS to get through that, to you know, go through, run your data through them. But what, as you're describing, what we're seeing now, what we actually started seeing with Hadoop, right? And any kind of data lake exactly. thing is people yeah. dump a ton of structured data, well, of pre-structured, uh, you know, data before it's been structured, right? The proto structured data, they throw it all in there. There's invariably a ton of metadata you want to actually structure around it. So you're using the database now as a glorified file system. And then you have tools like Python or R or other kinds of tools that then go and pull data out of that to almost like do a pivot, right? Into a different view, a different set of structures that are then implicit in the blob storage. And we saw people doing this with Postgres locally. And now as you're describing it, this is one of the use cases that people are doing with Python, Snowpark, in Snowflake, um, which is really, that's just, that's a super interesting thing. That's a really interesting thing to see that happening. Um, yeah. And it, it, it challenges some of the underlying assumptions, right? So with, uh, right. with, with, with schema on right, you're, you, you are not getting to this kind of experience, to, to this use case, right? This, right? this essentially leans on the capability that you can establish schema when you're reading when you're accessing the file and depending on what your use case is you may actually establish different 
schema different types depending exactly. on uh, what your use case is and when you read uh, that, that particular file. And, and, and that opens up a lot of flexibility and a lot of possibility. And uh, it's, it's fascinating for us to see how that actually drives additional use cases for us now. Yeah, well, and also as I think about how much of the, you know, when scientists don't use databases, right? Or when people do shadow data management, they take the CSV, they do all the stuff. Invariably, there's a lot of intermediate artifacts, right? Because their data pipelines then are, are bash scripts or Python or Perl or God forbid, aux scripts that they run <laughs> to generate other things. And so you end up with a ton of, like data residue all over the place. Um, and, and usually those data processes are not very well documented and you have reproducibility problems, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the interesting thing is that when you have this, uh, when you have the data now in the raw data, pre-structured, proto-structured, whatever, and you have the ability to write functions in Python to pull interesting values out to compute various derived um, attributes and whatnot, and then you take that and you add to it. You over you put it all inside this ability to do general, you know, relational queries. You have this thing that's like really mind blowingly powerful because you could do GIS libraries, right? You can do all sorts of stuff. You can do like in gene mapping, and you can find distances between different kinds of uh, genetic sequences. You can do all of those things in your Python code, and then take the result of that computation and use it in a select statement in SQL. And so as more of these um, use cases show up where you're merging the relational query, kind of the relational algebra, relational algebraic approach with this ability to transmute the data in situ, you remove the need to create all of these intermediate artifacts. You remove then a lot of the well, sometimes compliance issues, but certainly the reproducibility and general data hygiene issues that come from that. Yes. You're actually moving the code to data, but you're moving a much higher dimension of code into one central place for the data. Um, and I look forward to seeing customer use cases that look like that. Um, it, it's just interesting to see what come from that for sure. So um, one, one thing I wanted to, um, to sort of switch gears and talk about a little bit is of course, um, you know, the, the big news this year that you all have not only made a bet on Python in embedding it in Snowpark, but also on the front end, right? So the Streamlit acquisition and this uh, empowering um, users to write business applications and doing all that in Python. Tell me a bit about that and about what you're excited about with, uh, with the technology there. Yeah, so, and maybe taking a step back, I think the mm -hmm. uh, the the first observation for us was that besides putting data out there on on our data marketplace, which eventually led to to the data cloud, um, mm -hmm. we, we we've seen that that in addition to putting the data out there, uh, people are getting the most value out of it if you can also bring the corresponding code to the same marketplace, so that right. you actually have a package of data and code to process the data that makes that makes sense in, or the most sense if you want in, in, in tandem, right? So um, in, in, in order to, to help with that and, 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 and facilitate that in the interaction then also with uh, the data through an application, that is what motivated us to, to uh, acquire uh, Streamlit. And just to, to give one example, it really resonates with me um, is kind of thinking about a, a data scientist again. Mm -hmm. you, you as a data scientist, you're probably very familiar with a notebook environment, Jupyter, to uh, produce your, your your models and train them up, right? Mm -hmm. Now, for the end user who is the eventual consumer of that model, it's mm -hmm. typically not reasonable to assume that they are going to install a uh, Jupyter notebook on a container on their laptop just in right, order right, to... Right run that, uh, that that machine learning model for inference or for prediction. If they are a business user, they need a much more curated experience than, than, than that. And this is exactly one of those use cases where we're looking at Streamlit to close or to bridge that last mile between the data scientist and the, the actual end user in an organization. You would wrap that model, that piece of Python code typically, in a Streamlit application. And the Streamlit mm -hmm. application would drive 
the interactions with the end user. So for instance, there might be some input parameters required to drive the, 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 the model. You could uh, ask those through the streamlit application from the end user. There might be visualizations that the model produces um, mm -hmm. the data, mm -hmm. adding the predictions onto the data, right? You could visualize that in, in, in really powerful ways and also through that streamlit application. And right. again, we're right. we're looking at, at, at our at our marketplace and as a way to get these models wrapped by stream of applications distributed to the end uh, end users in uh, in the data cloud within your organization and, and, or beyond. And, and and it seems to me, and this may be a bit of a leading question, but it seems to me like in doing in, in, in doing that acquisition, also having this thesis that people will want to uh, not only consume but also you know make these applications for the data cloud in your in your marketplace. Um, you're putting a bit of a bet on people writing. These kinds of artifacts in Python, right? That that's it's um, that you know there's there's obviously some nice nice uh, uh, quality of life things in the streamlit tool, but ultimately people are writing code to express their ideas and to build these kinds of absolutely. And things. all 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 what I just said that applies to the Python community. I mean, less looking to right. to to us on the Snowflake side. We're we're not that many. Right? It's, it's it's really on the community and all of the Python uh, users out there to mm -hmm. to, to to do that. Right, right. Um, maybe, maybe I will build an app and sell it on the marketplace. So I can make some, make some beer money from it. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, yeah. So, so good. So we talked about this. Um, you know, the, the, the rationale and the motivations behind kind of getting Python inside the database, moving code to data, the different kinds of workflows that are powered by that, um, and, and you know, I think one of the things that that comes to mind, kind of, um, to, to kind of wrap things up here is thinking about like, um, you know, we're almost, even though this looks like a SQL database is swallowing the Python, right? By embedding the Python inside it and getting all this Python going to come into it, you know, would you would you agree with the statement that, that one could also look at it the other way, that Snowflake to some extent is using SQL as a Trojan horse, so to speak, to get more Python code into other use cases that prior would have been SQL only. Um, or is, is that um, me as the Python guy looking at it from a particular lens, biased the, lens? The, the, the way I, how I would probably phrase it is like bringing Python to the data cloud or bringing the data cloud to the Python community. I think it's really bi-directional. And I think that's right. where we're going to see uh, the most synergies. I don't necessarily expect one to wrap around the other. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, there, well, hope, there's there's value exchange both ways. There's value exchange both ways, um, and uh, and we certainly see. You know, I think the looking historical over the last twenty years, the growth of Python as a language, a lot of it is driven by the fact that it is a glue language, right? A glue together disparate libraries. I mean, to the first thing you said about why Python was hard to bring in was all these extensions for Python have native code inside them, like raw C and C plus plus code that is not guaranteed by any VM. You, you really have to do isolation at the operating system level, right? Yes. Um, and so Python gluing all these different languages together, gluing these libraries together, being a scripting layer over all of that, um, that's kind of how it came to prominence, uh, certainly, I, I, I would say. But now it's getting, it is definitely getting wrapped, right? It's definitely getting embedded and wrapped inside kind of a larger environment. Um, but I think actually this may be one of the biggest expansion opportunities for it, uh, period. Because the use of SQL, the use of you know the kinds of data, how serious the production data is that lives in traditional data databases and data warehouses, that is um, that's just massive, right? Uh, and so Python going alongside, going inside this kind of environment is a huge growth opportunity for the language. And um, it will be interesting as if we could track this to see how many users whose first experience with Python is Snowpark. That would be an interesting number yeah. to, for, but personally, and also I think for our respective businesses, right? That would be a really interesting number to track. And I, yes. I think that number will be growing quite quickly. I, I, I think that number will be probably shocking to all the community members involved. Um, but uh, yeah, any any parting thoughts? I've just kind of been starting off on all this stuff, but uh, any any thoughts on your end about kind of where we go next yeah. with all the stuff? Um, no, I'm I'm very much looking forward. I mean, I, from my perspective, I think we are just at the very beginning of this this, this journey, and I'm uh, I'm super thrilled by some of the use cases that that I see emerge from uh, right. Snowpark and uh, the the Python support, and I'm I'm very curious to see what what other use cases. Uh, 
customers will will bring, and uh, uh, we'll we we'll learn a lot throughout the journey, and that's uh, that's what I'm looking forward to. Same, same. I'm really excited about it too. Thank you so much for being uh, such great partners in this process. Really excited uh, for the collaboration thus far, and and for all the the great work we're going to do ahead. So thank you yeah. so much for joining us uh, today. Yeah. Really appreciate the conversation. So much fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Peter, and thank you for the partnership as well. Appreciate it. Thanks, Torsten. Thank you for listening, and we hope you found this episode valuable. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star review. You can find more information and resources at anaconda.com. 